Hi everyone and welcome to the internet. What we're going to be doing in today's biology lesson is actually starting the fifth biology topic, B5. So we just finished B4 in our previous lesson just before the half term break. So now what we're moving on to is B5, which is all about genetics. So what we're going to be looking at in today's lesson is the concept of variation. So hopefully by the end of this lesson, you're going to be able to explain the different forms of variation that we see. To start us off though, we've got three questions based around our previous topic. So have a go at answering those three questions in your books. Okay, let's go through those answers then. So for question one, the two types of decomposer are bacteria and fungi. So one mark for each of those you got right. The way that saprophytes actually feed then is that they secrete enzymes, one mark, and then they reabsorb the nutrients once they've been digested outside of that body. So second mark there. So first mark, they secrete the enzymes onto the surface of the dead material. That then breaks it down and they reabsorb the nutrients. In terms of how we could actually ensure that our compost heap is going to decompose as quickly as possible, then there are three potential marks here. First one is for saying we're going to keep it moist. Second one for saying that we're going to increase the amount of oxygen, usually by turning it. You might have said put holes in the side, anything that's going to increase the oxygen there. And finally, we're going to keep it warm. So not too hot, not too cold just right. So what we've got there is a total of seven marks. So give yourself a mark out of seven. Before we go any further, the first thing we need to understand is what on earth we mean when we say the word variation in science. So where we're talking about variation, we're talking about the differences within a species. So make sure you've got that definition for variation in your books. Once you've got that, what I'd like you to do is think back to when you were last in a classroom with your class. I know it's a distant memory these days for most of us, but hopefully soon we will see each other again, although not in our typical classes, I'm sure. Think of those people you used to share your space with. And what I want you to do is list as many variations within your class as you can. 
So definition first, then as many variations within your class as you can think of. So what I've got on the screen there for you then are just a few of these potential variations. This is not an exhaustive list, folks. There's many more things we could have said. So we could have had things like hair color. We could have talked about eye color, people's genders, their height, their weight, whether they wear glasses or not, the shape of their nose, the shape of their ears, the shape of their eyebrows, the shape of their lips. Many things have shapes, face shape, etc. We could have looked at hairstyles. We could have looked to see whether their hair is straight or curly. The list goes on. Anything that is a difference between those individuals of your class that mean that when you're there, you can look at someone and know who it is, then that is variation. So give yourself a tick for any of those you've got. And obviously you could very well have others that I didn't put on that list as well. The next key term I'm going to introduce here is the phrase phenotype. When we're talking about a phenotype, what we're referring to is an observable characteristic of an organism. So wherever you see this word phenotype, it's actually the thing you see. So that would be things like green eyes, brown hair, anything like that is a phenotype because it's a characteristic we can see on an organism. So make sure you've got that definition written down, phenotype, because it's going to come up time and time again through this topic of B5. So what we actually find then is when we look at the individuals that make up a population, we do have variation. There are different phenotypes that we can see. 
and there are two causes of variation. So see if you can fill out what those two causes of variation are for me. What we should have written down is we can either have variation caused by genetic factors or your genes or environmental factors. So those are the two we must know. If you didn't get them, obviously make sure you've got them written in your book now. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at each of those causes of variation, the genetic and the environmental in turn, to look and see what we mean by that and also what characteristics are actually caused by those two types. So the first one we're going to look at is the genetic variation. So see if you can write me a definition for genetic variation in your books. Just give you a minute to have a go at that. When we're talking about genetic variation, we're talking about variation that's caused by the genes that are inherited from the father and the mother. So make sure you've got that definition written down. If you got it right, give yourself a tick, but the key parts there is it's inherited genes from the mother and the father. And in terms of some of the examples, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, then these are the things that won't change. So things like your eye color. You're born with an eye colour and that's your eye colour for your life. Your blood group, again, you are born with a certain blood group, it doesn't change. And any genetic disorders as well, so things like cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease. These are genetic disorders, again, you are born with those genes. So make sure you've got the definition written down and those three examples. As I say, it's not all of the examples, there are many other variations caused by genes, but I just went with three in this case. So the second one, our environmental variation, 
again have a go at writing down a definition for environmental variation for me. So when we're talking about environmental variation, these are variations that are caused by the environment in which you live. So they're not things you're born with, they're things that you are going to get throughout your life. So it will be things like the language you speak. That's not determined by your genes. That's something you learn based around who you're living with and the language that they speak as you're growing up. It will be things like your accent. If we were to take two identical twins and obviously I don't suggest this, even though there have been some rather horrible studies done where they have done things like this. Then we take two identical twins. We're going to let one grow up in the United Kingdom and send the other one off to Australia to grow up. Then what we'd find is the one that grew up in Australia would have an Australian accent, whereas the one that grew up in England would have an English accent. So your accent is caused by your environment in which you live again. And then things like scars, tattoos, piercings, all of those things you choose to have, they're not genetic, they're environmental. And I'm sure that there's many children that are probably very pleased that their things like tattoos and so forth are not genetic, because otherwise whatever your parents chose to have as a tattoo would be passed on to you. And that wouldn't be great for all of us. So obviously environmental variation caused in by the environment in which we live. So the language you speak, accents, scars, piercings, tattoos, any of those. Make sure you've got the definition and your three examples in your book. One of the things we do need to bear in mind is it's not quite as simple as I've led you to believe. So where we're talking about variation, it's not just a case of it's genetic or it's environmental. There are some particular phenotypes that are literally just genes or just your environment, but there are many of these characteristics that you actually have as part of your being that are caused by both environmental and genetic variation. So both of them come to play to actually cause your final characteristic. And good examples of this, things like height and intelligence. So if we imagine that you've got two really tall parents, that doesn't instantly guarantee you are going to be tall. Because if we gave you a really rubbish diet when you were growing up that had very little protein in it, then you're never going to reach your true potential of your height. Your growth's going to be stunted. Just like intelligence, even if your parents are the smartest people in the world and we then sit you in a room, don't ever read to you, don't engage with you, don't get you thinking, you're never going to reach your potential again. So yes, there are some genetic links there, but your environment also plays a part. So 
we need to remember that we've actually got three different things we talk about when we're referring to variation. Those caused by genes, so the genetic variation only, the environmental only, and then those that are caused by both the genes and the environment working together. So make sure we've got that written in your book and make sure you remember those three causes of variation. I think it's about time we had a go at a six mark question. I feel like we haven't done enough of these. Now, six mark questions, if you remember, are the ones where you are going to be given a mark that is influenced by your ability to write in a coherent sentence. Now, do bear in mind, these are going to be marked by, in the most case anyway, science teachers. And as a scientist, we generally like things to be clear and concise. Now, in terms of the mark for your spelling, punctuation, and grammar, and so on, we're not going to beat you if you're not using lovely flowery adjectives and you know semicolons or whatever. Basically, put a capital letter at the start, put a full stop at the end, and spell the scientific words right and write as a sentence in a logical sequence, and you're not going to lose the mark for your communication. The rest of it comes down to your level one, two, three is the science part. So you can still, even if you'd failed to write a sentence anywhere in your answer, put it as bullet points, which literally had a couple of words for each, you could still potentially get five marks based on the question. You'd lose one because you hadn't written as a sentence. But good practice, write full sentences, capital letters, full stops, and try and spell the scientific words correctly at the least. So your six mark question is this. Everyone has different characteristics. This means we all look and behave differently. Explain how our characteristics are determined. Include specific examples of characteristics in your answer. Now, before I get you working on that, key things to remember about these six mark questions is there's always at least two parts to your answer. So in this case, we've got to explain how our characteristics are determined and we've got to include specific examples of characteristics. And the one way that people throw away their marks on these questions is they only answer half of it. So make sure you do those two parts in your answer. I'm gonna give you the usual six minutes to answer your six mark question.
move. So in terms of our answer then, the way this is going to work is you would get an answer based on level one, level two, or level three, and then your marks determined from that. So what we've got on the screen is the complete six mark answer. So we've used sentences, therefore we would get our communication mark there. So what we need to include in our answer, and just give yourself a tick for any of these points you've got as we go through, and then we'll talk about the marks in a bit. So variation in some characteristics can be caused by genes that are inherited from their parents. So if you've mentioned genetic variation on its own, there's your first tick. We then needed to give examples of genetic only, so blood group, eye color, absolutely fine. If we then went on to say some characteristics are determined by the environment in which we live, tick for that bit. And then we gave the example of things like scars, tattoos, and so forth. And then we talked about the fact that there are some characteristics caused by both genes and the environment. Give yourself a tick for that bit. And the examples of things like your height and your weight. Now, in terms of your marks, this is an old one. This one used to go up to the old E grade. So it's not going to be your higher tier answer here, folks, because it's not quite that easy to get these six markers. But it is certainly one that can occur on the foundation papers. So to get your level one, then what you needed to do was describe the role of genes or the environment. So if you said that some characteristics are caused by genes or some characteristics are caused by the environment, then you get two marks if you wrote it as a sentence. If you then went on to actually describe the role of genes and the environment, then you're up to your three marks there. And if you gave at least one example of a characteristic determined by either the genes or the environment, you've got your four marks. So that's where you're looking at that you've said that these are caused by genes only, and some are caused by the environment only, and you've given one example. So you could have said genes, e.g. blood group. So that's your four. To get your level three and your full six marks, then you needed to describe the role of genes and the environment, and you also gave examples of characteristics by each. That's five, and then to get that elusive six mark, then all we need to do is talk about the fact that some characteristics were controlled by both genes and the environment. So. Give yourself your mark out of six based on our criteria. So the last part about variation we need to look at is the fact that some variations can be continuous variation, whereas others are discontinuous variation. So jot those couple of points in your book for me. If we start off with continuous variation, first of all, these are variations that can take any value within a range, and they tend to be caused by both genetic and environmental variation. When we're talking about the genetic, they tend not to be controlled by a single gene, but they're actually controlled by multiple genes. And some good examples here are things like the length of fur. So obviously not in humans, we're not generally furry creatures, but if you think about cats, for example, then it's not a case of they're either short head, which means that their fur is all of length five centimeters, or long head, at which point their fur is eight centimeters long. It could be any value within a range. Just like skin color, you are not white, black, that's it. There's a whole range of tones of skin. So again, it's a range of values. And same thing with your height you've got every possible height imaginable that you could have. Now, when it comes to actually displaying continuous data, then the type of graph that we would use is a histogram. And it's really important that you remember that because they have had a question before where they've asked you what kind of graph would we use to display continuous data? And the answer is histogram. So drop those points down for me on continuous.
when it comes to discontinuous variation, then these ones result in discrete values. Now, what we mean by that is that they've got a very clear outcome that is either this or that, not in between. And these are caused by genetic variation, which are controlled by only one or a very small number of genes. And good examples here are things like gender. Now, when it comes to obviously determining someone's gender, they're either going to be male or female. Okay, there's not various shades in between. It's either male or female at that point. Now, the type of graph we would use to display discontinuous data is a bar chart. So make sure, again, you know discontinuous is on a bar chart. So again, drop those points down in your book. Depending on how good your maths knowledge on graphs is, you may fall into the trap of drawing the wrong type of graph or identifying the graph incorrectly. So just a quick reminder on our screen then, we've got a histogram and we've got a bar chart. So on the left is a histogram and we can tell it's a histogram because there's no gaps between the bars. And on the right is a bar chart and we can tell it's a bar chart because there are gaps between each of the bars. So make sure you know the difference between your histogram and your bar chart. The bar chart has gaps between them. Final thing for today then is your plenary questions. So those of you with target grade up to grade five, it's the two columns on the left. Those of you with target grade over grade five, it's the two columns on the right. So I'm gonna leave these up for about another three minutes today, but if you need longer, as always, just hit pause and take as long as you need to answer them.